Hey, Ali. Yes? Are you afraid of clowns? <laughs> Only <laughs> the creepy, serial murdery kind. That's a little creepy. I've never been afraid of clowns myself, but that might just be because I've never seen the horror classic It. So, Pennywise never really had the chance to freak me out. Well, now you're gonna have your own chance to develop a cholerophobia of fear of clowns because the new It movie is about to come out. Hey there, Brainiacs. I'm Ali Astrocyte, and this week I'm joined by Dr. Ali Matu, a clinical psychologist who also loves making videos about the brain over at the Psych Show. I'm Ali. You're Ali. So now we know each other. Correct? Okay. That's creepy. <laughs> hey everyone, I am super psyched to be here. No pun intended. Well, maybe a little pun intended. <laughs> Fear is a powerful primal emotion. It's how our brains react when we perceive danger, causing us to change our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors so we can best respond to the threat that's in front of us. So when I'm watching a scary movie like It, mm -hmm. I'll be feeling all right up until that moment that spooky clown with red hair pops out of the sewer. I'm startled and my brain translates that into fear. This leads to what is usually referred to as a fight or flight response, where you get ready to escape out of that danger or get ready to punch that clown <laughs> in the face. When we're frightened, our heart rate goes up. We start to hyperventilate. Blood vessels in our muscles open up and our pupils dilate. All ways that our body prepares to get moving while slowing down or stopping non-essential things, like digestion. This cascade starts when a scary stimulus activates the amygdala, a small brain region found inside and underneath the frontal lobe. We've mentioned the amygdala before in our video about anxiety. It's got many talents, but its primary role is managing emotional responses and linking those emotions to memory and decision making. The amygdala quickly informs the hypothalamus that something dangerous is going on, and the hypothalamus activates a pituitary and adrenal glands, letting them know it's showtime. <laughs> get it? Showtime? Yeah, I get it's it. It's a movie. The pituitary gland starts dumping ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, into the bloodstream, which tells the adrenal glands to release cortisol, a stress hormone that increases the amount of sugar in our blood and suppresses the immune system. The adrenal gland releases epinephrine, leading to increased blood flow into the muscles and triggers pupil dilation. This one-two punch of hormone action revs up the energy available to the body, preparing us for a confrontation. All of this happens in the first few milliseconds after we've been startled. As your body becomes activated, your thoughts begin to change to reflect the danger you're physically feeling. You'll exaggerate dangerous details, imagine what could go wrong, and look for a possible escape. Since you're taking in so much information and your body's working so hard, it might actually feel like time is down. No. Fear is considered a basic emotion. It's one that every human being experiences in response to danger. While there are a lot of things that everyone is afraid of, like a mouse running across your foot, that would freak me out, mm -hmm. humans can also develop fears that are unique to them. This is why fear can also be a learned emotion. Like if you've been bitten by a dog, you might be afraid in the future when you see other dogs. Mm -hmm. Classical conditioning can help us understand how this happens. Most people know about classical conditioning thanks to Ivan Pavlov. He trained dogs to associate the sound of a bell with the arrival of food. So eventually the dogs would start drooling when they heard the sound of a bell, even if there wasn't any food present. This can also happen with fear. Say you've seen it. Because of classical conditioning, your brain is an association machine that links together different things in the environment that appear close together. So Pennywise appears and the movie plays some scary sounds that startle you. Ooh. Then the image of that clown murdering a bunch of kids gets paired together. Over the course of the movie, your brain has associated a lot of scary sounds, images, and ideas with clowns. By the end, the clown represents a monster that could shapeshift into your worst nightmare. This is one way that people can develop phobias. Fear is a general emotion that our brains apply to any potentially dangerous situation, but phobias are an example of how our brain can apply fear irrationally. Even if a phobia is about a thing that might 
actually be dangerous, like lightning or sharks or monsters disguised as clowns. Those are dangerous. <laughs> they are dangerous. Stay away from those monsters. <laughs> what makes it a phobia is that a person will work harder to avoid it than they really need to, and this avoidance will start to get in the way of their life. Sure, a lot of people don't like clowns, but if you have a clown phobia, you might cross the street just to avoid a Ronald McDonald statue at your local Mickey D's. Or maybe you won't be able to concentrate on anything because you accidentally saw an image of a clown on the internet. So where does your brain come in? Well, there's evidence that an overactive amygdala can lead to anxiety disorders. Phobias are believed to stem from changes in the activity of the emotional circuits in the brain, specifically the amygdala and the hippocampus, which connect fear and other emotions to our memories. Think about it like this. People who struggle with phobias might have the volume turned up on their anxiety. Panic disorder is what happens when your body associates fear with fight or flight responses in situations that aren't really threatening, like hyperventilating. Again, it has to do with changes in the amygdala activity. Scientists and doctors are trying to better understand how the brain processes fear in order to develop better treatments and medications to help with these and other anxiety disorders. But in the meantime, there are a lot of resources out there, including anti-anxiety medications and behavioral therapy. I specialize in treating anxiety disorders, including phobias, and one of the treatments that I use is called exposure therapy. Exposure therapy involves slowly becoming exposed to the feared object in a controlled way. You learn to approach the thing that you fear, experience that fear, let your amygdala settle down, and develop new, more realistic ideas based on the experience you just went through. You can see me use exposure therapy to overcome my own phobia of bees in this video right over here. So if you have chlorophobia, maybe watching it will be good for you. Or maybe you just want to go get a boba doll. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of Neurotransmissions. And Ali, thank you so much for joining us to talk about this topic. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. If you're a fan of psychology videos and mental health, you should definitely head over and check out Ali's channel, The Psych Show. Ali shares his experience as a clinical psychologist to create helpful videos on psychology topics from how to be an adult to why we like to travel. He's also a giant nerd and loves to incorporate geeky topics like Harry Potter, Star Wars, and Jurassic Park into his videos. So seriously, go check out his channel and subscribe. Do you have any interesting phobias? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed learning about how your brain handles chlorophobia, hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to catch more of our fun collaborations in the future. Please also consider supporting us on Patreon. We couldn't do this without your support. Until our next transmission, I'm Ali Astrocyte. Over and out.